United States, black troops returned from World War I with high expectations for change. But they returned to a country that was not ready for equality, a country increasingly suspicious of radical political movements. In this unsettled climate, Garvey's appeal to disgruntled African Americans with military training sounded an alarm. Attorney General Palmer decided that there needed to be a special division of the Justice Department. He called it the General Intelligence Division. And he picked a young Justice Department attorney. He was really unknown at that time, but uh, must, have been, must have been known enough for his diligence and his name. Attorney General Palmer decided that there needed to be a special division of the Justice Department. He called it the General Intelligence Division. And he picked a young Justice Department attorney. He was really unknown at that time, but uh, must, have been, must have been known enough for his diligence. And his name was J. Edgar Hoover. Garvey really gets pinpointed. Hoover, the Justice Department, were, were clearly hooked on a fixation on Garvey, which would before long become a vendetta. J. Edgar Hoover wrote to a colleague, Garvey is a notorious Negro agitator, affectionately referred to by his own race as the Negro Moses. Hoover's agents were in the audience at Carnegie Hall when Garvey bragged that the UNIA would soon be strong enough to exact its own form of justice. When those crackers lynch a Negro below the Mason-Dixon line, since it is not safe to lynch a white man in any part of America, we shall press the button and lynch him in Africa. The agent reported that Garvey's address was met with great applause and much excitement. J. Edgar Hoover had long relied on casual informants, but now, in his determination to go after Garvey, Hoover hired the first full-time black agent in the Bureau's history. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Hallelujah. First and foremost, giving all honor, glory, and praise to the God of our ancient forefather, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the supreme intelligence of the universe. Also, giving due respect to our leader, Chief Prince of Paul, Ben Zivalun. Also, looking around at our princes and chiefs present as well, to our mothers in Israel, to the princesses, to the wives, to the daughters. To the entire congregation, I bid you in the tongue of our ancient forefathers when I say Shabbat Shalom, Shalom Alekim. Hallelujah. Give me a second here to just kind of shift books. All right. Let's open up to um, the book of uh, Exodus chapter 3 really quick. Um, we're not going to start right away. I'm going to just share some information real quick. Okay. Open up to the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. But before we actually get into the verse, I just want to uh, continue some of the things that I heard our chief prince say. So first and foremost... Uh, you know, a lot of us are familiar with the name Marcus Garvey. Some of us are familiar with his movement, the UNIA. Um, I think others are familiar with some of the individuals that Chief Prince of Poor named, such as um, Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford, 
and Rabbi Arthur Wentworth Matthews, who played a major role in that movement during that time. You're talking about this era was known also as the Renaissance era in Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance era, where the music in Harlem took over the world globally speaking in the form of jazz. So much things came out of the Renaissance era, not just um, in music, but in intellect and in truth and in sharing knowledge, so much information. And Harlem at that time was known as the Mecca of black thought. Every great black prolific thinker around the world at some point convened in Harlem during the Renaissance era. They all wanted to come in Harlem and meet some of those prolific street corner teachers that were in those areas in Harlem, which was known as the Black Mecca or the Mecca of Black Thought. Uh, with that being said, I just want to add to the conversation uh, some things that um, I studied as well with regard to the movement. So when we talk about a person like Arnold Josiah Ford, we know that he was the musical director for the UNIA. He uh, headed the music department. He wrote all of their hymns because when they gathered together, they sang songs, not just the women, but the men, like we do in here. They gathered together and they sang songs. Uh, he wrote their charter as well, which is powerful. It speaks to his understanding of how to run an organization. In order to write a charter for an organization, you have to have strong organizational skills, number one. And he wrote the charter for the UNIA. Uh, secondly, he was the one that stopped Marcus Garvey from continuing to refer to black people as blacks and Negroes. Before meeting Rabbi Ford, or Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford, Marcus Garvey was still referring to our people as blacks, coloreds, or Negroes. Rabbi Ford came in and said, we're none, of, we're none of the above. None of these things can identify a people. No people of antiquity call themselves after a color. So we're not black. We're not Negro, which is just Negro, the Spanish term for black. And we're not colored, which still is black, a color. That does not identify a people. He correctly said, if you would call us anything as a people, when you want to speak to so-called black people on a whole, why not use the term Ethiopia? Because he understood that in their day and in their era, in their European mind, already in their European history books, they were already referring to all black people around the globe as Ethiopians, be based on their understanding of history. So what he did was he shifted the paradigm from us being called just a color to us beginning to recognize a nationality to a certain extent. Although Ethiopian did not properly designate our ancestry, us as Israelites have to realize that if we look at the Israelite tree, some of those branches, you have Kush on it. So with that being said, Rabbi Josiah Ford understood that, understood that perfectly. And that's why he chose to help Marcus Garvey to kind of fine tune the message and share it in a way that would be more enlightening and more empowering based on truth and i.e. based on Torah. What a lot of people don't know about Marcus Garvey is this, especially those who push his contributions today in the Kemetic or Egyptian community. What a lot of them do not know or understand about him is that he was pro-Bible. As a matter of fact, one of his most famous and esteemed statements that he has ever made is that the greatest wisdom of the age can be found in the Bible. I'm going to say it again. Marcus Garvey is on record saying in reference to the Torah, the Bible, the greatest wisdom of the age can be found in the Bible. Let me just stop for a second. You think Marcus Garvey wasn't aware of ancient Egypt at the time? You think Marcus Garvey wasn't aware of Ethiopia at the time? You think he never heard of the book of the coming forth by day and the coming forth by night, i.e. the Egyptian book of the dead? Yet with his knowledge of all of those works of antiquity, he still came back to a foundational premise when he said, the greatest wisdom of the age is to be found in the Bible. That is extremely powerful. Why? Because just before the UNIA began to crumble, which is his organization, Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford was the one responsible to bring in or usher in the quote unquote religion of the Negro. What do I mean by that? Marcus Garvey was starting to, in his organization, redirect and rechannel not just our energy, 
not just our contributions, but our very vision and our outlook on the world, how we see ourselves and how the world sees us. And he began to slowly but surely negate all things Eurocentric in place for that which is Afrocentric. In doing so, he negated white Christianity because he knew it would not empower us as a people. With that being said, he negated the, the idea of any outside or to stay on the point, European influence on black culture and black thought. And in looking to construct what would be the spirituality of this people that he was trying to raise to a much higher estate, he had Rabbi Josiah Ford beginning to reintroduce what is what was termed in that time Black Judaism, what we know today as Hebrew Israelite culture. Before the UNIA crumbled, they were on the road to every um, member of the UNIA was going to become known as Israelites. This is based on the records that are kept today in the Schomburg Museum in Harlem. You have to go. Go to Alfonso Schomburg Museum in Harlem, which is on 137th Street, and see that they have an entire area dedicated to the Hebrew Israelite movement from the time of Rabbi Ford and Rabbi Matthews till right now. When you go there, you'll see the personal archive of Rabbi Ford and Rabbi Matthews. You'll see some of the letters exchanged between Rabbi Ford and Marcus Garvey. You'll see Marcus Garvey speaking about Hebrew Israelites and Hebrew culture and Hebrew thought. And in those exchange of letters, you will find out that they were on the road to reclaiming this as our spiritual identity. That is powerful because most people don't know that. But here's something else most people don't know too. There was a, an extreme antagonist to quote unquote black people on the rise during the era of Marcus Garvey. At the time, he was just a young lawyer. His name is J. Edgar Hoover. Um, the FBI, whom he is in part responsible for creating, because prior to him, it was just known as the Bureau of Investigation. Uh, with him, it became the Federal Bureau of Investigation because he revamped and changed their entire course of how to track and trace criminals. He was the one that introduced fingerprinting to catch criminals. It was in the J. Edgar Hoover uh, administration that fingerprinting became a key way to catch and capture criminals. And that was something that he ushered in. So he was a person that issued, ushered in, for lack of a better term, a socio-political renaissance within the government in this country and that he revamped the way that they apprehend criminals. Now, because Marcus Garvey was such a young, prolific thinker at the time, J. Edgar Hoover immediately took interest in him, and i.e. against him, as J. Edgar Hoover is known and was known to be an extreme racist. And during his era, he sought by all means necessary to infiltrate the UNIA movement to bring it down to the ground which he succeeded in doing, and for the most part. What he did was he set up the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which by the way, this is history, so you need to know this and listen very, very well and very, very carefully and very, very keenly. The FBI was formulated first and foremost to bring to halt or complete stop of all black movements that were on the uprise in this country. Did you hear me? Let me say that again. When the FBI was formulated, it was principally formulated in this country to suppress black movements, i.e. black power movements, any movement geared to bring the so-called Negro to a more balanced or empowered spiritual and socioeconomic estate. This was seen as a direct threat to America because in order, to America, in order for American system of government to thrive and prosper, we have to have what? capitalism. Do you know that the foundation of capitalism is slavery? Black Wall Street, the very first slaves that were sold on this side of the Atlantic and the East Coast, what do you think they were um, auctioned off from? What is known as today Wall Street. Wall Street by name literally identifies all the black slaves that used to line what was a big wall. And in that era, it was also known as Black Wall Street. We need to learn history. We need to become so empowered with these things because now when you look at it, you begin to understand how much of a role that you played in the prosperity of this country, which is why if you recall in the Torah, 
the creator said that when the children of Israel left Egypt, that they did what? They spoiled the Egyptians. The Egyptians, which of course the biblical term spoil means that they took back that which was what? Theirs. The Israelites brought Egypt to the um, financial and even political estate that it ultimately became. Egypt was not the great superpower before Joseph went in. Let me say it again. Egypt was not the great superpower that it is known to be before Joseph went in. It was only when Joseph came in and with the famine coming in at the same time that all of the people turned around and sold everything that they had to the king. This made the Pharaoh rise to a very high, not just political power, because if everybody in the surrounding countries are paying me their money or giving me all that's theirs, guess what also happens simultaneously? I control you because I got your money. So automatically, with people selling him everything that they owned, he became the highest political power in all the neighboring lands. And then having their financial wealth just enhanced that. With that being said, we have to recall these things because they're so pertinent in understanding how much the history of the Israelites in America today correlates with the history of the Israelites in Egypt yesterday. It is a perfect correlation. There is no better match than what we can see as it is being played out today in our era as what we can look into the Torah and see what's being played out before our ancestors' eyes as well. So with that being said, it is imperative for you to know that the FBI was formulated to suppress so-called black power movements in this country, and it was created by and headed by J. Edgar Hoover. And I want you to consider this keen fact as well. The very first FBI agent who was black is known as Agent 800, code name. Why? Not that they all didn't have code names, but he was the first to have his code name precede his regular name because most of them had names. And then there was the code name that ad came as like what is called a surname. It, it came after their name. His code name preceded his name because at first his identity was concealed. He was created specifically, excuse me, he was hired specifically. A matter of fact, let me go back to the word I use. He was created specifically. I like that better. He was created specifically to infiltrate the UNIA movement, which he did. His real name is James Wormsley Jones, also known as Agent 800. This is quote unquote black history that you need to be aware of. The very first black man hired as an FBI agent was only hired and created to infiltrate black power movements in this country. You understand that? You know, so today when we celebrate the black person that's the first to do this and the first to do that, if we run through all those histories of all those firsts, I'm gonna tell you right now, in a lot of the history, a lot of those firsts, there's a lot of things behind the scenes to why they were ushered in and became the first in what they're doing. Let me just let you know right now, even in the world of acting, and we recently had an actress who became um, one of the first to get an Emmy. I believe she's one of the stars for um, the sitcom, not sitcom, one of the um, reoccurring um, stories on uh, how, to get, how to Get Away With Murder, the black lady, right? She recently won an Emmy, and in that field, she was the first to do it. And guess what happened the very next episode? She's on camera kissing another woman. There's a reason for everything. They whispered to her, you want this Emmy? Well, guess what you got to do? You want to be known as the first to do this? Well, guess what you want to do? James Wormsley Jones. You want to become a part of the Federal Bureau of Investigation? Well, guess what you got to do? You got to go against your people and against God. I'm going to tell you right now, that's synonymous. When you go against your people, you go against God. When you go against, in, in, in particular, I'm talking about this great people, Israel. When you go against your people, the children of Israel, you are going against the almighty God because we are the children of God. When you go against his children, who you think you're ultimately going against? You're going against God himself, which is why the creator says in our defense that the reason why he showed us mercy is lest the nation say that there was no God on our side. 
because everyone knows that when you mention the name of Israel, you are mentioning the name of God as well, literally and figuratively, because our name is Yisrael. God's name and title is included in our very name. Our role is synonymous with his actions. We must understand that. Uh, moving on is another thing I want to say, and, is an, and this is so pertinent, it's not even funny. How many people, by a show of hands, have ever been to um, 34th Street and uh, 1st Avenue? Between 34th Street and 1st Avenue, 42nd Street and 1st Avenue, the United Nations. A lot of people in this room, by show of hands, who ever been to, either inside or passed by, drove by the United Nations, 42nd and 1st Avenue, right? All right, and you know, if you've ever been there, you can admire the facade of the building. It's a very beautiful building. You know, um, there's so much to that building that you don't realize. And keeping it in the frame of thought of talking about Marcus Garvey for a second, you know, Marcus Garvey was the first black man. Let me say, let me say that again. Marcus Garvey was the first man, I stopped myself in saying the first black man because when I thought about it, I had to realize the truth in the matter. He was the first person in this country, either black or white, to do what I'm about to say he did. So let me stop myself by saying he's the first black man. Marcus Garvey is the first man of this, in this country who caused over 120 different nations to come into the country and convene on political matters. Let me say it again. Marcus Garvey is the first person in this country who caused over 120 people from other countries, representatives of other countries, to come and convene in this country on political matters. What am I speaking about? If you lived in Harlem during the Renaissance period, circa the early uh, 1920s, right? You would notice that annually there was a major rally and parade in Harlem. And you would notice that in this parade, you would have representatives that was coming all the way from the Sudan, people that were coming from Iraq, people that were coming from deep in Africa, people that were coming from all of the countries in the world that have people of color. Marcus Garvey was the very first person in this country to cause delegates from all major regions of the world where people of color are represented, represented as far as India to Africa, which includes the Middle East, to come to Harlem for his parades. With that being said, don't take short or light the power of the voice that God put in you. Because with the small voice that he had and with the small knowledge of the Bible he had, he caused all the darker people of the earth to send representatives to Harlem to say that we are gonna be represented in this parade because this parade speaks to the empowerment of colored people throughout the world, which during this time was suppressed. Hence the creation of the FBI. They says, wait, hold on. This right here cannot be. You mean we understand that this guy caused a bunch of people in Harlem to react. We understand that people in the South found out about him and started moving up North. We realized that people was leaving the West Indies because of what they was hearing that he was doing here. But you mean this guy is causing major delegates to come from other nations to convene with him in Harlem because the parade closed out their meeting. They came for an entire weekend. From Thursday till Sunday, they were speaking behind closed doors on these matters, which is the state of the Negro, quote unquote, in America, and the state of colored people throughout the world, because as it is now, it was then, Europeans control the world. And Marcus Garvey was one of the first people around the world in this country to spearhead a movement to tip and equalize that balance and bring us back up. And automatically, it would have brought all of the darker people around the world up. And they realize the power. And when I say they, I mean all of these darker people from, by darker people, of course, I'm talking about people of Indian descent, 
I'm talking about people that come from Iran, the Middle East. I'm talking about people that come from Africa, people that come from all the darker regions of the world. And excuse me, because I definitely missed out on Brazil and South America, because Brazil and South America sent almost half of the delegates that were there. There were a lot of them represented. With that being said, guess what was created almost 15 years later? The United Nations. Do you know that to this day, the creation of the United Nations is accredited to the, what Marcus Garvey was doing in the Harlem Renaissance because he was the first person to call for delegates all around the world to convene on political matters and political processes. And what did the enemy to this uprising do? They still do it to this day. When you invent something, they take it and put their patent on it. 